first Sunday in Advent, the Collect. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace that we may cast away the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which thy Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the quick and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost now and ever. Amen. The epistle is written in the 13th chapter of the epistle of St. Paul the Apostle to the Romans, beginning with the 8th verse. O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. Here endeth the epistle. The Holy Gospel is written in the 21st chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning with the first verse. When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway shall find an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, 
This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, liturgically speaking, Happy New Year, because... We're now at the beginning of another liturgical year with the first Sunday in Advent. And it's a season that is of great antiquity. The emphasis was always on the four last things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell. The purpose of Advent was to prepare for the second coming of Christ. That's really what it's about. And I know that people today think of it as, uh, oh, the rush to get ready for Christmas. But you'll notice that the emphasis in, in the scriptures that we're going to be reading these next few weeks are going to be mostly about when the Lord returns, what that means, that he will come again in glory to judge both the quick and the dead. And in our, as we pray in today's collect, and the collect that we pray every day in Advent, you know, that we, we pray that we will have the grace to cast off the works of darkness and put upon us the armor of light that at his coming, we may rise to the life immortal. Now, when one considers this very real emphasis throughout this season of looking for the coming of Christ in glory when he returns to judge the quick and the dead, it may seem puzzling that what we're reading about is what happened on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, before the service even starts, when, I mean, in, its, in terms of the actual Eucharistic liturgy, before that, we begin with the blessing of the palms. And I read this sort of very same thing. We read this very same passage just before blessing the palms. And that's, so nobody has any problem with why is that there on Palm Sunday? Because that's what happened. But why is it here in Advent? And I believe the reason is because in his first coming, this is the thing that is most like what his second coming will be. That he's being welcomed into the city by a joyful crowd proclaiming him to be their king. And also, he proceeds immediately to an interesting kind of judgment. It's a judgment of cleansing. He uses scripture. He, he alludes both to Isaiah and to Jeremiah. Isaiah, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And then alluding to Jeremiah, but you have made it a den of thieves. Now, the, the, the reason there was money changing going on there, the reason there had to be an exchange, was because the people who ran the temple, uh, mostly Sadducees, uh, were, had it all worked out. They, they, they decided that you could not spend the imperial coin in the temple grounds probably because it bore the image of Caesar. It was pagan money, and Caesar was by the Romans considered a god, so you couldn't use this money on the temple grounds. You had to change it, 
And most of the people had to do this because they they had to have sacrifices and therefore they had to buy the birds and the animals for sacrifice. And they couldn't really carry them all that distance. And But the exchange rate was dishonest and terribly corrupt. And the people were being greatly cheated. And so Jesus said, you know, you've made my house into a den of thieves, basically. Because it was, it was a very dishonest, a very unfair, inequitable exchange rate. And uh, what historians would know is that Caiaphas had a, a little agreement with Pontius Pilate, you know, so they could, he would get part of those proceeds too from that money extorted from the people. So Jesus cleanses the temple. He immediately goes into judgment mode. We see him then as the king. We see him as the judge. And his judging is a cleansing. The temple is the place of God's manifest presence, especially behind the veil. Now for us, in the epistle to the Hebrews, we have deep, deep biblical teaching on the meaning of the temple. And I will say this, uh, the place of God's manifest, glorious presence when Christ comes again is going to be the whole world. And the cleansing of judgment is part of what we may rejoice at if we truly believe, because as it says in the book of Revelation, there'll be no more death, nor sorrow. All these former things will be forgotten. They will pass away. And it's important to know that they'll be forgotten. So many people, because the life we live is one in which we have tragedies, we, we seem to think that God will somehow make sense of all the things that have gone wrong, but that's not the good news. The good news is all these former things will pass away. They don't have to make sense. They weren't necessary and they're going to pass away. And for us, it will be like waking from sleep to rise from the dead in the glorious coming of God's kingdom. That's what we have to look forward to. So the judging that we see Jesus do is to cleanse the temple because it is supposed to be a place of God's manifest presence, because it is the place of God's manifest presence. In fact, and the place of his manifest presence when he comes will be the whole world. You see, this is why the emphasis is to prepare the way of the Lord. This is why we will be studying from the Gospels about John the Baptist during, during Advent. He prepared the way of the Lord by preaching that people should repent and be baptized. So I believe it is in this coming into Jerusalem that there are lessons about what is to come when Christ returns. Now, we can't really imagine what that's going to be like, but we know it'll certainly be more exciting and glorious even than this was. Christ rose from the dead and in his immortal nature, this life that cannot end, he has rescued us and he will give us that same life. He's dealt with our sins on the cross. He has cleansed us from our sins. Just as he did this in fulfillment of all of the prophetic foretelling of the blood that was shed in the temple on the altars, all of which was types, images, shadows of the reality. Christ dying to take away our sins. Then he rose from the dead and he gives us immortality. This we will, we will enter into it and we will know and we will understand it. And right now we can't even imagine it. Now, what does it mean to be ready 
for the coming of the Lord. Well, first of all, we should be ready to face the Lord in judgment at any time. We should be ready to appear before his throne at any time. For most of us, it is likely that death will come before Christ's second coming and we will die and we will leave this mortal life. And this is not something for us to fear. But whether, whether we die today, tomorrow, or 20 or 40 or 50 years from now, we need to be ready today right now because none of us is guaranteed another breath you know none of us has promised this so to prepare for the coming of the lord is the same as being prepared now for your own death that is have no willful sin that separates you from god <clears throat> cleanse out of your life any anything that is a barrier between you and the Lord. And then also, if you have any resentment or bitterness, forgive, forgive quickly and be free of that as we heard a few weeks ago. And then know that Christ died for your sins, know that he rose again and believe the gospel and believe the good news then you're ready, whether it's your death or the coming again of Christ, you're ready to see the Lord. You're ready to stand before his throne. Now, in everything I have just said, and because it's the first Sunday in Advent, but you will hear in the exhortation, should put you in mind of the fact that all of these things that you must do to be ready to face the Lord and stand before his throne are the very same things you would do so that you may worthily receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you have enough confidence today to receive this sacrament, then you are also, I trust, aware of God's grace and you have confidence to face the Lord himself. That both is, that's how serious it is to receive the sacrament. It is also the good news that you can know that today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. The idea that we must wait to find out what God will do with us is not correct. No, you make sure now, based on what you know from his word and what you've heard in his gospel, you make sure now that you know that your sins are forgiven and you may boldly approach the throne of grace because that's how you prepare in your own heart the way of the Lord. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, be ascribed as is most justly due, almighty majesty, dominion, power, and glory, henceforth world without. Amen. Amen.